works. Okay, so I'm Adam Pingle. I'm an engineer here at BigLink. Um, this, the talk uh, amongst the, the three of us uh, here tonight from BigLink is going to encompass uh, the business and architecture. I'll cover that. Uh, Katrina is going to talk about link insertion in depth. And then uh, Gabor is going to talk about product categorization. So I just want to set the stage for those next two talks really quickly. Um, so Oliver mentioned um, moving value from the destination back to the origin. And the affiliate marketing is the actual mechanism by which we accomplish that. Um, I've, a lot of the actual uh, affiliate programs out there are um, a little, I, I wanted to elide a lot of the details, so I just created this fictionalized uh, hypothetical example here. There's some merchant Acme, um, they, they want to, they want to encourage people to link to their products, so they need to create this web service which will allow people to send them traffic um, and, uh, or, and, and get the revenue uh, moving back the other way. So in order to do that, uh, the, the source needs to send the encoded ultimate destination URL um, as long as uh, an identifier for themselves and um, an identifier for the specific click. Um, and this is just a visual visualization of what VigLink does. You can imagine um, some of these links may have already been uh, included by the author. Uh, we have uh, this link insertion technology that finds additional product references. Um, just a few bullet points about the business. It was founded uh, late 2008. Uh, we had a profitable quarter uh, in 2013. Uh, raised some money last year um, from uh, there's a list of our backers right there. We're about 45 employees. I think we've been growing a lot recently since the summer. Um, we just moved into this space, as Oliver me has mentioned. Um, we have just a few metrics to characterize the, the business. We have hundreds of thousands of publisher campaigns and about 50,000 merchants. That includes large merchants like, like eBay and Amazon, but also aggregators like Commission Junction. And uh, just to you know, prove that we do in fact have some Scala here. Um, we've historically been a Java shop, and over the last couple of years, more Scala has been working into our core uh, runtime uh, components. Uh, you can see it coming in there as the number four um, programming language. Of course, we all know that any language on the right, one line of that counts for, for a few of, the, of Java, so, you know, got to weight that accordingly. Um, and in, in our ad hoc analytics, uh, Scala is actually um, over 40% of the lines of code there. So that's where it's really taking off. Um, really high level architecture. Uh, we're all on Amazon. Uh, we're in three Amazon data centers. In uh, Oregon and in Ireland, we just run the API. And in Virginia, we run the API as well as all the link insertion technology that you'll hear about later, uh, log processing, uh, uh, biglink.com. And uh, altogether, um, I, I didn't do the aggregate here, but I, I think we're, we're peaking uh, consistently above 10,000 requests per second to the API. Um, at a really high level, um, the, there's some JavaScript running on a publisher's page that we make available. Um, it'll send a, a ping and an insert call. Uh, in, in reality, we actually can batch those together, typically. Um, the ping is just, hey, I'm here, and the insert is, uh, please give me all of the, the links to insert. Uh, Katrina's going to talk about those actual data structures in a minute. Um, and behind that, we've got you know, MySQL and Cassandra. Um, and, th and there's, in a couple slides, we'll go into much more detail. Um, I think I'll, I'll skip over a lot of this stuff, except to say that we, uh, it, so this is up here, the, our API producing raw logs, which get merged, they flow into Redshift. Uh, the revenue feeds processors, of course, are an important part of the business. And then from a, a large set of these uh, merchant or merchant aggregators, we get offer feeds. Uh, and we will we put those in Elasticsearch. Uh, and that's an important part of the link insertion pipeline. And um, I think the last slide here is um, it, just a high level uh, schematic of, of the link insertion pipeline. Uh, Katrina's going to go into that in, in much more detail. But at the end of the day, um, we're we're receiving insert calls from these publisher pages. Uh, we've got a monitor watching the logs and making sure um, that, it's, it's, that the content is either not too old, too stale, or if it's never been seen before, we will, we will uh, insert a request to crawl the, the content into this SQS queue that will cause a crawl. Uh, after the crawl, we will then run the link insertion pipeline, uh, which uh, brings the content of the, of the page together with 
what all the offers that we have in Elasticsearch and produces a set of matches. And then those set of matches are available to subsequent insert calls for that page. And uh, now I'll hand it off to Katrina to talk more about that. Yeah. Thanks. What you said? Okay. Okay, so after a lot of infrastructure and architecture, we're going to have a little bit of a deep dive into how this link insertion actually, better this way, how link insertion actually works. Um, okay, so the goal is for a given page, find all the products which are kind of mentioned in text, find these in text and actually link them to offer databases and ideally to the offer from which we or our publishers can earn the most money when someone actually buys this product. So what we need to do for a given page is first, you know, find the offers. It's basically an entity recognition part, um, task. Um, and then we subsequently for every, yeah, for every, for every of these products we find, um, check our Elasticsearch offer database, which is huge if we have any offers which could match this phrase. And that's kind of a funnel process where we end up having a lot of potential offers, which we have to filter for some business logic, depending on the, on the users, um, and then do some semantics on top of that to really find offers which perfectly match this phrase. Well, and in the end, we might select based on some business rules to, yeah, to eventually find products from which we tend to earn most money. Um, so that's kind of, kind of a view. We, have, we tend to have a lot of offers for every, for every potential product and removing some, removing accessories, and then eventually we find that one could be the most valuable for us. Um, so NLP related tasks we are having, going through these, it's basically an entity recognition or product recognition on large scale linking, then the question, how, how are we dealing with our offer database? What do we have to do to curate it? How, how are we keeping it? How can we search in it? Um, a little bit of understanding our offers, since offers are kind of unstructured, and we have to do some, some logic on top of that. And then on top of that, we do have a taxonomy of product categories, product terms, how this all works together to help us understand um, the stuff. Um, all right, that's kind of hard to see, I guess, but just in quick, the product recognition for us means to recognize all these different things. It could be product terms. Um, we have something which we call branded product categories. It's a brand name and a, a type of thing. Could be a Samsung smartphone, for example. It can be product lines. So in the whole world of products, there's a lot of different kind of words we're actually interested in. Um, and all these should be recognized. Um, and yet, so for those of you who are familiar with, this is a typical named anti-recognition problem. It's kind of a sequential tagging. So we have a sequence of text, a sequence of words, and you want to distinguish for every word, is this part of a product name or not? Um, and usually named anti-recognition is pretty hard to do on a dictionary-based approach. So it's, it's kind of impossible to use just a dictionary, match it against a text, and by this find all the product names. Um, there's a lot of spelling variants. Um, there's new products, which you will never have in your database. There's sub-products, um, um, sub-numbers. There's a lot of ambiguity. So words could be product, but could also be standard um, English word. Um, it's context dependent and so on. And so in the end, we end up with um, a hybrid approach where we have statistical models to help us, but also dictionaries, of course, help. Um, some rules also help, and all this goes together in kind of an ensemble approach. Um, and the good thing here is that we do have some thresholding, which helps us to define a level of precision and recall, um, depending on users' needs. Um, OK, so for those of you maybe familiar, conditional random fields um, is a sequence labeling model, which, which is used a lot for this task. It's actually um, structured prediction what we're doing. So instead of predicting for every word um, independently, whether it should be a product or not a product, um, we actually create um, a sequence of words. And we use the surrounding words as information about um, the current decision. Um, and so there's a scheme, a tagging scheme, which is called the IOB. So for every word, we mark whether it's the beginning of, in this case, a product, inside a product, nothing at all, product category, and whatnot. Um, and then usually what has to be done here is a lot of feature engineering to find out um, what your model should be informed about. So what's interesting is usually the word itself, the tokens, maybe a stamped form, um, a lot of information on orthographical or morphological stuff, such as um, suffixes, prefixes, maybe word patterns, 
Are there dashes? Are there a lot of numbers inside? Is it capitalized? And all this stuff um, helps the model to learn. Um, for sure, context is important. So how do the neighboring tokens look like? Um, there's certain indicator words which, which help to know if this word tends to be a product. Um, word modifiers seem to be very helpful. Pronouns, articles, quantifiers, etc. And in the end, we make use of our taxonomy and dictionary um, to inform the model about extra information, such as brand names, um, typical product features we know about. So all this goes into the model. Um, and then we have um, a test and training set which we use to actually get this model and evaluate our model. Um, in parts, this has been published um, in a previous Kaggle competition in 2012. 12? Right. Um, so we have a lot of different categories and for, most for the most important ones, which is automotive, consumer electronics and fashion for us, since that's where we have the most products and the most pages actually, um, we do have a test set of documents. Um, and it's maybe interesting to see that um, in fashion we tend to have more product lines since there's fewer specific products. You have a shoe which is kind of a line because there's a lot of different sub-models. Um, in consumer, consumer electronics we have more specific products, for example. So there's certain distributions about that. Um, and for training our model we additionally make use of um, click data. So we take all our log files or parts of our log files and see where people used to click on because we assume that this is kind of correct or at least kind of interesting to get a little bit more training data. Um, so this is a tool we're using for the annotation. It's called Brad. Maybe some of you have heard of that. It's kind of a configurable tool where you can set up the type of, um, of annotations you want to do. It's pretty good for sequence labeling, but can also be used um, for any kind of relation annotations. Um, we added some extensions for um, for pre-labeling, correcting annotations, also inter-annotator agreement calculations to see how well a human annotator actually does. Um, so this allows us to, in, a, in acceptable, acceptable time, to actually get some data for testing. Um, and then, oh, all right. And then evaluating this. Um, so without going into the details, we, we have a couple of models, as I said before, which go into an ensemble. And they have different performance values. So there's numbers called recall and precision. So recall usually tells you the coverage, so how, how many of the actual entities does your model recognize. Precision tells you how precisely this, this is done. Um, we have models which are super precise and others which tend to be rather sloppy. Um, so they recognize phrases which are not actually products in our very clear definition. But it shows in the end we have to keep these models in since when we do A-B tests it shows that people like to click on this little bit of sloppy terms, um, which still lead them to interesting sites. Um, and so we came to the decision that that's actually our, the model we want to use. In the end, we do have this precision recall curve, um, where we can still decide for a given publisher who might be more interested in high quality links. Um, we can still say, OK, let's, let's have a level somewhere here. We are very much interested in precision. We lose a couple of product links or potential product links by that, but we can ensure that the quality is higher or we can go the other direction and go more for recall and sacrifice a little bit of precision. All right, so once we, once we got this, this is one of the potential product links, once we got this, um, the task is to link that to the most correct product offer. And this already gives you an idea um, that a product offer usually is much more than this little bit of a product mention that we find in text. And that's actually the challenge here to, to find the correct product offer. Um, so challenges, offers are unstructured. So this is one of the offers, a Polk Audio, Plaxstone, TL, 1600, and so on. So all this is in the offer. Um, the offers usually contain a lot of accessories. So you might be interested in an iPhone, but in the end what you get here is an, a button replacement. Um, okay. We have a lot of overloaded offer titles. Um, you know, it comes with a cover, it's free shipping, it's like new, and this goes on and on. Uh, this goes on in a way that sometimes offers are just nonsensical. It just kind of doesn't make sense to link to those at all. Um, we see especially words like iPhone, iPad, they just sometimes tend to um, concatenate all of these just because it makes them likely to be found. So we have to make sure that we actually filter those out. Um, linking is also hard because of high diversity. So we have about 30 different 
industry types, starting from beauty products, going to home and garden, over out automotive to consumer electronics. So it's a big variety. We have a lot of different motions. Um, everybody has feet, uh, 20 feet structures, and all these could be structured a little bit differently, and that's what we have to deal with. And in the end, it's, it's just pure volume. I mean, it's a couple of hundred million um, offers out of which we have to select the best offers, like semantically the best ones and also those which, which optimize revenue for us. And just to give you an idea, when we're looking for iPhone 5, we actually find 650,000 offers which contain this and not all of those you actually want to have. Um, so how do we get where we want to get? Um, we usually start with the a kind of semi-structured query to Elasticsearch, which gives us a lot of offers. Um, we're basically looking for kind of a normalized version of the product mention. Um, we do a couple of restrictions, basically by industry type and user-specific settings. Um, then there's some business logic on top of that to, to filter even more. And then what's more important or more interesting is what we do on the semantic side to get to you know, a set of offers which are actually acceptable out of which we can select. Um, and the question is, given a, a product mention and an offer candidate, is this, is this an acceptable offer? Um, and there's different um, aspects to which we came, which, which are interesting to do that. The first question is, um, is this offer actually valid for my given my given mention. So say we are looking for jeans and we're finding a jeans jacket. Well, it's about a jacket, so it's actually not valid for what we're actually looking for. The second question would be centrality. So if you order this thing, open the box, you were looking for an iPhone, but you're taking out a replacement button. That's also not what you were looking for. That's the question of centrality. What is this offer actually about? Well, the first one is really about a metrics amp, specific one for headphones, but still it's a metrics amp. The second one, well, you will not buy Voodoo, you will buy the um, DVD player. Um, and then centrality is kind of related to that, uh, accessory is kind of related to that, because a lot of time non-central offers are essentially um, accessories. And all this you want to know about, and once you do that, um, you can have kind of a decision tree which guides you through the process. So if an offer is, val is, not val is valid and not central, then we have to decide if it's not an accessory. That's kind of a weird thing. That's this voodoo thing where it's not the center and it's still somewhere in the offer, but hey, wh what does it mean actually? Um, and this goes on with some more um, category specific logic to actually guide us to the question, are we dismissing this offer or are we actually keeping it? And we have a lot of different heuristics and learning-based approaches to, to come there. Um, again, we have some training data. Um, I skipped this here. And um, maybe some statistics on the data, which is interesting. We see in fashion, we hardly have accessories. That's because you won't find so many accessories for a sneaker, except maybe for shoelaces or stuff. But um, in automotive, we have a lot of accessories since we hardly sell cars or maybe motorcycles on our in our offer catalogs, but tons of parts. Um, so there's different distributions of, of these problems. Um, in the end right now, we are at a precision of around 70% um, for this um, decision tree. So there's clearly room for improvement, um, but it's a good start. Um, okay, so I'm gonna hand over to Adam for more on the offer feeds. Now, I'll just describe our offer store really quickly and give these guys a chance to uh, swap the, the mic. Uh, so we consume feeds, uh, approximately 20 different feeds. Some of these feeds are composed of, uh, I think, hundreds of files, um, in this one case. Um, that, uh, that nets us about 400 million offers. And we refresh that every single day. So the, the, there's a long story behind our offer store. We, we started off many years ago, well before I was here, um, just embedding Lucene in a Tomcat container and running it that way. That, that worked for a while. Then we moved to solar, um, early versions of Solar 3, still on a single box with lots of memory. Uh, and then in around early 2013, um, on top of Solar 3.5, we did our own sharding, uh, just product ID Mod 5. So you can imagine that wasn't the most uh, flexible arrangement. Uh, with our own with ELB load balancing, so what we went to about a year ago uh, was Elasticsearch. Um, 
uh, it has handled as high as 10,000 requests uh, per second. Uh, I think we run typically much closer to that two number these days. We've done a lot more tuning, a lot more caching. Um, the, the, we have about 30 nodes in the cluster. Um, depending on the index size, we're going to be anywhere between one to eight shards um, with uh, no replicas. And we are um, uh, we unioning these effectively with an alias so that the, the, the link insertion pipeline gets to view all of these different feeds as a single index. Uh, just to make this really concrete, this is an example of a feed we get with uh, some uh, in-ear headphones, some neon pink in-ear headphones. Uh, so we get gigabytes of this kind of thing every day, um, and we turn it into something like this. So it's a normalized uh, JSON document. Uh, there's a picture, we had an image URL there. Um, things like a, a category, it's in consumer electronics. We've got a fairly a, a flat uh, categorization uh, hierarchy at the moment. Board's going to be speaking a lot about that. Um, and yeah, the, the process is what you might imagine. We have to parse these things, extract the relevant fields. Uh, we, write, we write them to an elastic search index, uh, which suffixed with uh, underscore write. Um, and concurrently, we'll be writing that to S3 as JSON. Uh, that helps, uh, uh, that's appropriate for some analytics workloads that we run against these offers. Uh, when the write is done, we'll swap it, uh, call it underscore read. We'll drop the old index, and uh, these things stay around for three days. Uh, for a lot of business reasons, we don't want to have stale offers in the offer catalog. And uh, if things are working correctly, we're going to be refreshing these things daily anyways. Um, and this has been written uh, in a very stream-oriented way. Um, Shake, our expert elastic search guru, uh, has, has done this. And we've um, also been prototyping Aka streams uh, lately uh, so we can get some back pressure flowing through the system. And now I'll hand it off to Gabor. Um, so as Oliver mentioned, I was a little fortuitous I, I arrived here. But in a sense, it wasn't. I, uh, when I knew that um, text was coming, then that's when I decided to jump into the space. So the timing was somewhat planned, and it, but it, it did work out a little bit. It, the focus that I, I, I took was to understand and to apply it to production systems where that knowledge can make a, 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 a small but substantial, even if it's only cents per um, item. So one of our main challenges is understanding offers. So we have lots of them. But here's an example of one. This, as uh, Katrine mentioned, this Polk audio. What does it say? Well, um, we want to decompose this. And maybe now a uh, human can look at this. You, you, you all can. But we want a machine to be able to do this and to do it for a wide gamut of um, product offers. So the way we thought of this is to parse it. So instead of treating it directly, we, if you can see down here, and I'll have more examples, put some structure to the text and labeled the uh, chunks. So as, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of varieties. So there's over a billion, well, I know there's more than a billion offers out there. Um, we don't have all of them right in our Elasticsearch, but uh, one day we will. Um, but we have a lot of them. We, and so there's just a, 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 an incredible number of this. And I'll, I'll put a small plug for this talk. So I already gave this talk at KDD. Uh, I have a paper there. And so if you look for my knowledge base, uh, this paper and talk is, is uh, there. And so back to our, our, our task. So uh, um, who's uh, built uh, maybe a conditional random field models on text here? Any machine learning people here? Some? So, so this is the takeaway message. So as soon as you see that you have to uh, build um, an, a machine learning system, I recommend that you create some annotated data. If, if, if you can't get people, uh, have enough resources to annotate some data, the problem is probably not that interesting. So we, we have uh, an annotator that annotates some data, and, and one of those is Katrina and I. Um, it's good to do the first bit of annotation yourself. So annotate a lot of data. So uh, no, no special uh, uh, tool required, but you, you have to think about what you're annotating, what you're trying to accomplish. So, um, and Katrina already mentioned this, so let's say that we tokenize the string, but you'll, I repeat it in part because you'll also encounter this, you know, this is one of the takeaway messages of the state of the art. What you typically do is you put the labels here with this BIO labeling, 
and then you move that over here because this is your label and now you're going to put some features around here what's the first character you, you put a bunch of features this new deep learning method is trying to get away from doing this engineering but uh, for now um, you, you have to get your hands dirty and actually it's also good to know what the, the space is so that's typical uh, as Katri mentioned we use it for recognition we also are using it here so what do what was the pr so we did five full cross validations we divided the data into five chunks and then tested it, 57.7 F1. So that's sort of low, but you know, the, the, what you have to look for in, uh, when you apply machine learning is that your task doesn't require 100%. If it requires 100%, you're probably uh, picking the wrong task. You want to pick tasks in machine learning where there's some, some room for error, and here it was, and I'll tell you why. But we, what we did notice is that some categories like books and arts and entertainment did poorly. Huh, uh, maybe we can, Let's, un let's explore, so now we're exploring in the model, so we're let's not just take it on its own, let's find out what this behavior is. And this is where the, the, the interesting part of it was for us, is that sure enough, when you train just on books, you, you set aside the books, and you don't include all the other noise, like consumer electronics, then it gets great performance. So we get that lesson, I ideally this would happen automatically, that it would not recognize this division. For now we do it manually, but, um, I'll show you in the next slide, oh no, this past one. Uh, so when we grouped uh, each one of these, we had several models and uh, lifted from the 57.7%. So well, another nice outcome from this work, as, as, as I sort of require and demand of myself, is that there's a, a ret return on investment. It's not just a, a proof of concept toy. So here are some example of terms that we didn't know about that weren't in our dictionary and so Prior to when we did the work, there were hardly any clicks on these terms. After we did this work, we scoured our Elasticsearch, found these terms as being significant, added them to the dictionary. Now we have uh, clicks on them. So, and each of these clicks is pennies, but this is just uh, eight of them instead of the 100,000 that um, are, were added. And um, those 100,000 pennies uh, paid for the project in a few months. And um, another little hint is uh, to, to not do it all in one uh, bang, to, to iterate and to add examples with, when there's low confidence, focus on those where the edges are. And so then your annotator is just fixing, remedying some of the problem areas that goes by faster. Like if, if, it's com if it believes that these two are together, split them up. So that's... Uh, Another direction we're going now, and so this is more now future looking, is that you notice that these were our categories are fairly shallow. We're, we're trying to really expand this, and so this is going to make it a little more difficult, but we're, so far we're having success at even modeling hundreds of nodes. Thousands will be a, a problem, but that's where we're going. So this is where we, uh, the kind of depth that we want is um, to categorize each of those offers at a very, very granular level. And uh, some recent work it's been sort of fun. Uh, I don't know if you've have you heard of Word2Vec. It's this new deep learning system that Google put out. Actually, I mean, they're the ones that got the buzz, but there's been a lot of other work similar to it. But it's fun to look at. And so we're automatically finding clusters in our offers. And so what are these? Oh, these are cell phone batteries. So automatically, we didn't ha I didn't have to hire anybody to, to discover this cluster. All they needed to do is to tell me that those are that. So I, I recommend that you... If, but there are some unsupervised ways, semi-supervised ways that are, are, are getting some tracks, some good mileage, some good discoveries. These ones were discovered and um, that's <coughs> speakers. So there's some uh, nice new work coming along the way in the, in the neural network. This is not near, uh, deep learning because it's actually just one hidden layer. So it's shallow network, but it's, uh, um, it is recurrent. So uh, lots to do. I, you know, I've, I've been at it here now for three years. So there's too much to say. Um, but, um, but if you're interested, then uh, you should definitely uh, contact us. So this ontology is your building. So you want to grow a deeper ontology? Yeah? Yes. Uh, so is this uh, automatic ontology? Uh, is it automatic or is it uh, manual or combination of So it's combination. Uh, certainly we gave the, the beginning of it and in part we inherit some of the structure from all our merchants. They have our own understanding of 
uh, for an initial divisioning. And uh, then to go deeper, we have a human sort of, because that's fairly easy, you know, the, the returns on that investment diminish as you get more granular. And so that's what this, this looks like a nice opportunity is there would be the ability to grow concepts automatically and then find ways to link them. It looks promising, but stay tuned. Any other questions on our technology, maybe, on Elasticsearch, or, yeah, yes? Where is the difficulty between making something more generic versus go after the domains and training them? Um, because it seems like there is the challenge. Well, um, would you, let's say, if we go back to this, uh, so is this generic enough? Like, is that a gamut of, like, this is about 30 different Industries, all and those, all of these are in Elasticsearch. Are you? If there's a new industry that wants to use oh yeah. Services, would you have to make a specific effort for them first, or just they just go into the funnel and there's no no need of both of you going in? Right. So one way I think of it is transfer learning. You've done all this work. Does it, what you've learned transfer to this new domain? And now that we've done all these, uh, it transferred fairly well. So uh, we found that adding a new one, like you know, a big step was going when we had from consumer electronics and automotive and going to fashion. You know, we needed to do a little more training, but uh, now it's getting far more very general. So each of the, for example, we don't have models for each of these industries. It's one entire, one only one model, but we, we did have to occasionally give it a little more evidence. And they recommend that too, that you don't just throw it out there and let it sit there for years, you, you continue to give it a few hints, um, but that's not as painful just to occasionally give it more information. So very general, one model for all these industries, um, but we do occasionally add more training data. And what I showed here is that in this case, books, yeah, books, you should have a, an individual one. But other than that, each of these others benefited from having evidence of the others. So. Okay, but just to clarify, you don't have to create a different or specialized ontology for each domain. No. You have about one ontology. That's right. For the universe. We do, yeah, so all those features just go in and whether the fashion terms de decide to use them or not, it's up to the model. Thought I, back there, yes? Uh, how do you guys feel about training like Facebook or Google or say, I have like confidence of certain products? Um, like, how do you feel about Sure, so the question is uh, how do we handle with the addition and removal of offers? So I, I think Anna might be able to help with uh, the processing. Because so, in part, it's an elastic search problem. How do we time, put timeouts there, and we, we just feed them in? It's, it's just a, All right, well, thank you again.